Do you want to play the Witcher games, but are afraid you'll miss out if you don't read the books first? Or maybe you've already played the games, but want to know what happened in the books? Well, look no further. In this video, we'll cover all the Witcher books. Beware of spoilers for the first Witcher game in the Netflix series. But don't worry, there are no spoilers for The Witcher 2 or 3, so you are free to watch this video if you haven't played them yet. Alright, we've got a lot to cover, so grab a cookie and buckle up. Let's start with the first book, The Last Wish. The Last Wish is a collection of short stories and is considered the first entry in The Witcher series. The collection consists of seven short stories, each forming a flashback in the life of Geralt of Rivia, who rests in a temple after being injured in a battle. So let's dive into each story. So there's a king, Foltest, who's got a bit of a situation. His daughter Ada was born as a Striga, which is a really scary monster that goes around terrorizing the town every night. But get this, Ada is actually the result of an incestuous union with Foltest's late sister, who was also named Ada. Ew, right? Anyway, Foltis has offered a reward to anyone who can lift the curse on his daughter, but he's adamant that no harm can come to her. He's given Geralt permission to kill her only if she can't be turned back into a human. But Geralt's not so sure that even if the curse is lifted, Ada can go back to being a normal human. So Geralt's decided to spend the night at the old palace where the Striga lives. But then this shady character, Lord Ostrit from Novigrad, tries to bribe Geralt to leave. Ostrit dislikes Foltis and wants to use the Striga as proof that Foltis can't rule properly. But Geralt's not having it, so he knocks Ostrit out and uses him as bait. The fight with the Striga is intense, but Geralt manages to defeat it, even though the monster is resistant to silver. But when Geralt goes to approach Ada, who seems to have been restored to human form, she attacks him and claws his neck. Geralt passes out, but when he wakes up, he's in a temple being told that Ada's being cared for by the king and that he's earned his reward. Phew, glad that's over. For those familiar with the games, this short story will sound familiar since it is essentially the cinematic intro of the first Witcher game, which is quite fitting. His name was Geralt of Rivia. He was a witcher, a professional monster slayer. An unusual contract to lift the curse that held a monarch's daughter. It was enough to spend the night with the princess, dusk till dawn. If only she were not a deadly beast, a striga. The traitor responsible for the curse became the bait.
One day while strolling through a forest, Geralt stumbles upon the bodies of a man and a girl with some strange injuries. Following their trail, Geralt comes upon a spooky mansion that seems to be deserted. As he scopes out the place, he spots a lady lurking in the woods. When she sees Geralt, she runs away. Braving his nerves, Geralt decides to approach the mansion and meets its owner, Nivellen. Nivellen is a bear-like beast, but Geralt is not one to be scared off easily. Nivellen invites Geralt inside, and Geralt discovers that the house is enchanted in response to Nivellen's commands. Nivellen also shares his tragic story with Geralt. Once a bandit leader, Nivellen assaulted a priestess, who then cursed him to become a beast. The curse can be lifted with a kiss from a maiden, but Nivellen has yet to find one that works. So, Nivellen invites girls from nearby villages to stay with him in hopes of breaking the curse. But nothing seems to work. As Geralt is about to leave, he warns Nivellen about Verena, his latest love interest, whom he suspects may be a monster. But Nivellen is smitten and is hesitant to give up on her, even if it means remaining a beast. On his journey, Geralt has an epiphany and returns to the mansion. There, he discovers that Verena is actually a Bruxa, a creature with vampire-like tendencies. She has been feasting on Nevelyn's companions, including the girl and man that Geralt found in the woods. A battle ensues and Geralt is no match for Verena. But Nevelyn comes to the rescue and pierces Verena with a pole, causing her to confess her love for him before dying. This confession breaks Nevelyn's curse and he transforms back into a human. Geralt reveals that there was a grain of truth in the old stories about a maiden's kiss lifting a curse. True love is what ultimately breaks Nivellen's curse. Geralt rides into the town of Blaviken on the eve of a festival with a beastly carcass in tow. He's hoping to get some coin for his troubles, so he seeks out the town's alderman, Caldmine. But to Geralt's dismay, Caldmine refuses to pay up. However, a guard tells Geralt about a wizard who might be able to help him out. Off they go to the wizard's tower and guess who it is? None other than Stregobor, a mage Geralt has met before. Stregobor tells Geralt about a cursed woman who wants to kill him and asks him for his protection. Geralt thinks it's a load of nonsense and heads out. Meanwhile, the assassin, Renfri, and her band of mercenaries enter the town. Geralt meets Renfri at a tavern and learns that she's seeking protection from a king. Caldemain confirms this, but things take a turn when Renfri tells Geralt that Stagobor tried to kill her before. Geralt tries to persuade Renfri to forgive Stregobor, but she won't budge. Despite this, Geralt and Renfri spend the night together. Are we surprised? The next day, Geralt realizes that Renfri is planning to massacre the townspeople to get Stregobor. He rushes to the marketplace and confronts Renfri's mercenaries. Geralt senses that they mean no harm, but he attacks them anyway. When Renfri arrives, Geralt asks her to leave, but she refuses. It's a heartbreaking moment when Geralt kills Renfri, but it's the only way to save the people of Blaviken. As if things weren't bad enough, Stregobor shows up and demands to perform an autopsy on Renfri's body. Geralt stops him, but the townsfolk see him as a murderer. Caldmine steps in and tells Geralt to leave and never come back. And that's how Geralt becomes known as the Butcher of Blaviken. We find Geralt relaxing at the castle of Sintra, Queen Calantha's throne of celebration for the betrothal of Crown Princess Pavetta, and Geralt's been graciously invited to attend. All is going well until an uninvited knight with his face all covered up arrives. Who is this guy? Well, he's Urchin of Erlenwald, and he claims that Pavetta's father promised him her hand in marriage before she was even born. Calantha acknowledges the knight's claim, but refuses to marry off her daughter to a complete stranger. So she forces him to reveal his face. When Urchin finally takes off his helmet, everyone's jaws hit the floor. The knight has the face of a hedgehog, and he's covered in fur. Naturally, this freaks everyone out, and the other suitors attack him. Thankfully, Geralt and the king of Skilliga step in to defend Urchin. But things really get wild when Pavetta reveals that she's in love with Urchin and wants to marry him. The other suitors lose their mind and start fighting. 
but Pavetta unleashes her latent magical powers that threaten to turn the inside of the castle to rubble. Geralt, East, and the Druid Counselor, Mausak, manage to calm Pavetta down, and it turns out that Urchin isn't a monster after all. He's actually a man named Dooney, and he and Pavetta have been secretly seeing each other. Eventually, Kalantha begrudgingly gives her blessing to their marriage, and she even agrees to marry Ist after she saves her from Pavetta's magical outburst. Dooney thanks Geralt for saving his life and offers him anything he wants. Geralt, being the sneaky devil he is, invokes the Law of Surprise, which means he gets whatever Dooney finds when he gets home. It turns out that Pavetta's pregnant with none other than Ciri. So, Geralt gets to claim the child as his own. And with that said, Geralt rides off into the sunset, showing no signs that he wants to be involved with Ciri at all. Oh, poor Geralt. Little does he know, destiny would eventually intervene. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Geralt and Dandelion are in a bit of a bind, unable to find any work in Upper Posada. Geralt scoffs at the locals' tales of monsters, dismissing them as mere superstition. But things take a turn when they arrive in Lower Posada and meet the village elder, Dune. He shares a story about a troublesome Dovil, but warns that killing the creature is strictly off limits. Out in the countryside, Geralt and Dandelion come face to face with the Dovil, which turns out to be a goat walking on two legs. The creature hurls iron balls at the pair after a bit of insulting banter with Dandelion. Needless to say, they don't stick around for long. A local witch and her apprentice help to identify the creature as a sylvan, and they forbid anyone from killing it. Unfortunately, Geralt and Dandelion's curiosity got the best of them, and they end up getting knocked out and taken captive by ancient elves, who are hiding out with the sylvan. Things get tense when the elves break Dandelion's beloved loot, but Geralt manages to negotiate for his friend's life. The queen of the fields, who happens to be the young witch from the village, arrives on the scene and speaks with the elves leader, Phil Evandril. Eventually, Geralt and Dandelion are released, but not before making a powerful enemy in Philavandril. The trio ends up sitting around a campfire and contemplating their next move. Who knows where their adventures will take them next. Dandelion and Geralt are out fishing, and to their surprise, Dandelion reels in an ancient amphora. Being the curious person that he is, Dandelion decides to open the seal on the amphora, thinking a genie will appear to grant him three wishes. But things take a wild turn when the genie ends up attacking him. Thankfully, Geralt is there to save the day with a bit of magic, and rushes Dandelion to the nearest city for medical attention. The city, Rind, is under heavy duties for spellcasting, and there's only one spellcaster in town, the sorceress Yennefer. Geralt seeks her out for help, but she has a dark ulterior motive. She wants to use Dandelion as bait to capture the genie. Geralt, being the noble hero he is, refuses to put his friend in danger. But Yennefer is not one to take no for an answer, and she uses a spell to paralyze Geralt and whisk Dandelion away. Luckily, Geralt has some friends in the form of three detainees, two elves and a half-elf knight. They inform him about the troubles in the city and that Yennefer cannot be trusted. When Geralt wakes up, he finds himself locked up with Cyrodiil. That's when Cyrodiil drops a bombshell. Yennefer used magic to make him go on a rampage through the city, punishing anyone who insulted her. Geralt and Cyrodiil are brought before the town's mayor and head priest, but Dandelion shows up through a magical portal, proclaiming Geralt's innocence. Chaos erupts as Yennefer tries to capture the genie, which is now loose and threatening to destroy the town. Geralt tries to save Yennefer, but she's determined to capture the genie and use its power for herself. But here's the twist. Geralt realizes that the genie is actually bound to him because he was the last one to hold the seal on its urn. He uses his last wish in a mysterious way that manages to save Yennefer and the town, but the genie escapes. In truth, Geralt had wished for him and Yennefer to be bound forever. Afterwards, Geralt and Yennefer do what Geralt and Yennefer do. And that's the story of how Geralt met Yennefer. Geralt and Dandelion are on their way out of the temple when they're ambushed by Falwick, Talus, and a bunch of soldiers led by the pint-sized Dennis Cranmer. 
the knights lay out a sticky situation for Geralt, one in which he must accept Talos' challenge but can't harm him, or else he'll be killed. Yikes. Geralt reluctantly agrees to the terms. But our clever witcher has a trick up his sleeve. He parries Talos' sword so that the guy smacks himself in the face. Dennis sees the loophole and lets Geralt go, hoping they'll meet again. Falwick's not happy about the outcome, but Geralt decides to give him a chance to prove himself by offering a challenge. Falwick's silence is deafening, and Geralt gives him props for listening to the voice of reason. But before Geralt heads out, he accidentally touches Lola's hand and bam, they all see a gory vision of Geralt's future. It's not pretty, and there is blood everywhere. But Geralt dismisses it and says he's seen it all before. He says goodbye to Nenek, and he's off to his next adventure. That's a wrap on the first book, The Last Wish. Before we head over to the second book, Sword of Destiny, let's take a detour and talk about the book, Seasons of Storms. Now, a lot of people end up skipping this book because it's just kind of random and doesn't fit neatly into the story. Technically, it takes place before the Striga situation, but after all the other stories of The Last Wish, so that's why we're covering it here. Anyway, let's dive in. Geralt arrives in the city of Karak, ready for some rest and relaxation. But things take a crazy turn when he's suddenly arrested for embezzlement and theft. But don't worry, someone bails him out, though he loses all his belongings, including his trusty swords. Geralt runs into his old friend Dandelion, who spills the beans on who put him behind bars. None other than the sorceress Lita Need, aka Coral. But that doesn't stop them from having a steamy affair. With his sword gone, Geralt sets out to find the thief, leading him to the Pyral Pratt, the big boss of the criminal underworld. But before he can retrieve his weapons, Geralt has to slay a demon at a castle full of crazy mages. And of course, things don't go smoothly. Geralt ends up getting tortured and caught up in a border war between Temeria and Redania. Luckily, he meets a helpful dwarf named Adario Bach, and they team up to get to Novigrad where Geralt's swords have ended up at an auction house. But nothing is easy for Geralt, and he and the crew of the prophet Leboida have to battle a vengeful Agara, essentially a fox demon. Meanwhile, Yennefer buys Geralt's swords without him knowing, and he returns to Karak feeling pretty down. But he teams up with a werewolf to take revenge on the demon he previously faced, gets caught up in a coup d'etat, and even has to weather a massive storm. Eventually, Geralt leaves Karak with Dandelion and his partner Mosaic, Lyda's servant. They have a chance to encounter with another witcher, Brihen, but thankfully a woman who gave Geralt his swords diffuses the tension. Geralt hears about a new contract for a Striga and has to give up his fortune to take it on. He even has a fling with the woman who gave him back his swords, Tiziana Frevi. Shocking. And of course, no adventure is complete with one final showdown this time with the Aguera Lysica. Geralt and Dandelion continue on their journey, ready for whatever the road throws at them next. And that's a wrap on Season of the Storms. Let's now talk about the second entry in the Witcher books, Sword of Destiny. The book features six stories that are loosely linked in chronological order and introduced some of the major characters in the later novels. One of these characters is Ciri, who is introduced in the story, The Sword of Destiny, named after the book. So let's dive in. We start by Geralt meeting a traveling knight named Bork, three jackdaws, and his two bodyguards, T and V. They're on a mission to find a green dragon. But Geralt's like, yo, I'm a witcher, but I don't kill dragons because they don't mess with humans. Regardless, they team up with a bunch of other characters to look for the dragon, including Geralt's friend Dandelion and Geralt's ex Yennefer. Eventually, they find a golden dragon named Villain Trenton Mirth. He challenges anyone who wants to fight him, and one of the knights takes him up on it, but loses. This makes the party lose their nerve and several members flee. Behold, the dwarves and the mercenaries decide to team up and take on the dragon together, while Geralt and Dandelion disagree. Yennefer gets so angry that she paralyzes them and ties them up. She tries to take down the dwarves and mercenaries by herself so she can claim the dragon's insides and cure her infertility, but ends up getting taken down herself. 
Suddenly, the dragon gets bored of waiting and jumps into the fight, taking out the mercenaries and the dwarves. He gives the party a young green dragon. T and V then show up and reveal the Borg was actually villain Trenton Mirth in human form. As villain Trenton Mirth resumes his human form, he explains that the green dragon called him for help and left him with her treasure, aka her baby dragon, as payment. Geralt asks the dragon why he pretended to be human, and the dragon admits that they actually like humans, unlike the rest of the dragon kind. He says that Yennefer's infertility is a done deal. But Yennefer's still determined to find a cure. Then he turns back into a dragon and flies away. Geralt is on a mission to take down a Zugul, living in a trash heap outside of Aid Ginvil. After a successful hunt, he heads back to the inn where he's staying with Yennefer. However, the town's atmosphere is getting to him, and he's feeling a bit short-tempered. Yennefer insists on staying, and she has a sorcerer friend named Istred, whom she's visiting and loves the town's history. The following day, Geralt meets a warrior named Cicada, who works for the alderman Herbolth. Herbolth pays Geralt for taking down the Zugul, but subtracts a small tax. Geralt finds out that Yennefer has visited Istred multiple times, which doesn't sit well with him. Cicada then proceeds to harass Geralt. Later on, Geralt meets with Istrad, who confesses his love for Yennefer and proposes to her. However, Istrad believes that Geralt's presence is making it difficult for her to decide. He claims the Witchers can't feel emotions and that he would be a better match for her. Geralt, on the other hand, is sure that Yennefer loves him as they had been together the previous night. But Istrad smugly tells him that Yennefer also slept with him that morning. Ooh. When Yennefer returns home, she and Geralt have a deep conversation about their true motives. Yennefer uses her magical abilities to create a black kestrel and asks it what the truth is. The bird replies with, The truth is a shard of ice. This sets the stage for the coming events. Geralt and Istrad agree to duel for Yennefer's hand, but her both intervenes and forbids Geralt from killing Istrad because the town needs him. Exhausted and emotionally drained from everything, Geralt walks down a dark alley, unarmed, and is attacked by two thieves. They recognize him as a witcher and leave him alone, but not before one of them tells him to not involve others if he plans to end it all. The next day, Geralt defeats Cicada and his men before meeting Istred again. Istred has received a note from Yennefer saying goodbye to him, but Istred still wants to fight Geralt. Geralt repeats the thieves' words to Istred before walking away. Geralt and his friend Dandelion meet up in Novigrad. They end up in an inn with a halfling merchant named Dainty Biverlin, who's too scared of Geralt to be of much help. Suddenly, another second beaten up Dainty shows up. But it turns out that the Dainty they were talking to was actually a Doppler named Doodoo. Sneaky little Doodoo. Doodoo tells them that he's been using Dainty's identity to make a fortune but he's also being hunted by the city's secret police because Dopplers are considered dangerous monsters. Thankfully, they met a banker named Vim Vimvaldi, who explains that Dudu's seemingly worthless purchases were actually a cover for legitimate business deals that made Dainty a ton of money. However, they still need to catch Dudu and bring him to justice. When they finally find him, Dudu transforms into Geralt and tries to fight him, but he's just too nice to be a real threat Dudu just wants to live in the city without being hunted, so they come up with a plan. Dudu will live as Dainty's cousin and work for him in the city, using his newfound wealth to build more eternal fire altars. In this story, Geralt tries his hand at being a translator for Duke Glovel, who's looking to propose to his mermaid sweetheart, Shinaz. Unfortunately, things don't go as planned, and Geralt doesn't get paid for his services. But that's not the end of the story. Duke returns with a new job for Geralt, involving a mysterious pearl diving boat and a terrifying sea monster. With the help of his close friend, Essie Davin, Geralt sets out to uncover the secrets of the sunken city of Wise. But it won't be easy, as they face attacks from undersea creatures and warnings from the mermaid, Shinaz. Along the way, Geralt and Essie share a kiss. Hm. But Geralt realizes that his heart belongs to someone else, the enchanting Yennefer. Despite Geralt's objections, 
Duke decides to go to war with undersea creatures, but he's in for a surprise when Shanaz shows up on land as a human, ready to marry him. Geralt, Dandelion, and Essie travel together for a while, but Geralt and Essie eventually part ways, never to see each other again. Essie sadly passes away a few years later from smallpox epidemic, but she's buried with her loot in the pearl that Geralt gave her. In the end, Dandelion composes a beautiful ballad about Geralt and Essie's doomed romance, but never performs it. It's a bittersweet reminder that even in the midst of danger and adventure, love can still find a way. Geralt is on a mission to deliver an important message to the Queen of Dryads, Ethne. But things take a turn for the worse when he stumbles upon a crime scene, complete with a few dead bodies and one injured survivor. His friend Frexinet. Suddenly the Dryads show up in Brain, one of their own, offers to guide Geralt to Ethany. As the journey through the lush last forest, Geralt and Brain encounter a massive centipede threatening a young girl named Ciri. Being the brave and skilled warrior he is, Geralt swiftly takes care of the pest and Ciri joins their party. She quickly takes a liking to Geralt and explains that she's actually a princess who ran away from a forced marriage. Eventually they make it to the Dune Canal, the heart of Brocklin. But Ciri soon realizes that the Dryads have ulterior motives and plan to keep her there indefinitely. In fact, they have a history of brainwashing young girls and forcing them to become part of their culture, just like they did with Brienne. After meeting with Ethne and having a deep discussion about destiny, Ciri is given a choice, stay in the forest or leave with Geralt. Ethne even makes her drink some special water to help her forget her past life, but it doesn't affect Ciri. As for Geralt, drinking the water helps him realize that Ciri is actually the daughter of Pavetta, making her the promised child of destiny, as per the law of surprise of the first book. Geralt and Ciri wake up outside of Brocklin, but their journey isn't over yet. They need to make their way to tell King Venslav that Ethne won't be conceding any land to him. Along the way, they encounter some nasty mercenaries sent by King Ervil, who are up to no good. Geralt fights them off with the help of the Dryads and the Druid named Musak, who has been tasked with bringing Ciri to Sintra. As they make their way to Sintra, Musak reveals that Ciri's arranged marriage has been canceled, and Geralt must take her with him, as per the Law of Surprise. But Geralt hesitates and attempts to leave Ciri behind while she sleeps. Of course, she wakes up and protests, insisting that she is his destiny. But in the end, Geralt walks away, leaving us wondering what will happen next. Geralt finds himself in a bit of a sticky situation when he saves a merchant named Yurga from some pesty monsters. But Geralt is no ordinary hero. He's a man with a plan. He extracts the Law of Surprise from Yurga, which means that he gets something unexpected in return for his services. After defeating the monsters, Geralt is badly injured, but luckily Yurga comes to his rescue. He gives Geralt a healing potion that sends him into a deep sleep, where he dreams of memories from his past. In one memory, Geralt spends Beltane with his beloved Yennefer, but they both know they can't stay together. In another, he visits Sintra and tries to guess which child is Pavetta's. Geralt is always seeking to understand his destiny, but he also believes that there must be more to life than just fate. Geralt awakens to find his mother Vicenna tending to his wounds. He wonders if his fate has brought them back together, but she dismisses the idea. Geralt learns about the Battle of Sodden and visits a monument to the fallen sorcerers, where he encounters death himself. He is heartbroken to learn that Yennefer is among the dead but Yurga tells him that the last name on the list isn't Yennefer after all. Geralt rescinds his law of surprise and receives Yurga's son as payment instead. As Geralt's journeys with Yurga, he recalls meeting his friend Dandelion and learning of the fall of Sintra. But there is a ray of hope when Yurga's wife reveals that she has taken in a young orphan girl. That girl turns out to be none other than Ciri, the child that Geralt has been searching for all along. Geralt and Ciri embrace, and she asks him if she is his destiny. Geralt knows that she is something more, and he is grateful to have her by his side on his adventures once again. That concludes the second book, Sword of Destiny. We are officially done with the short story collection, as the third book, Blood of Elves, is the first full installment of the Witcher saga. The saga lasts through the eighth book, Lady of the Lake. So, let's get started.
the Empire of Novigrad launches a brutal attack on the Kingdom of Sintra, causing chaos and tragedy. Queen Calantha tragically takes her own life, but her granddaughter, the fierce and feisty Ciri, aka Lion Cub of Sintra, manages to escape. But the Emperor of Novigrad has his sights set on Ciri, who is also his own daughter by the way, hoping to marry her off and legitimize his rule over Sintra. Meanwhile, the rulers of the Northern Kingdoms are none too pleased with the state of affairs. The war has left the economy in shambles, elves and dwarves are wrecking havoc, and cultists are prophesying the end of the world. The kings decide that they have no choice but to go to war once again, hoping to regain control of Sintra and stop the empire from further damaging their land. Unfortunately for Ciri, this also means the kings are out to get her. Thankfully, Geralt is there to protect her and take Ciri under his wing. He brings her to the Witcher's Keep, Kaer Morhen, to train her. She's taught the art of monster hunting by Geralt's longtime teacher, Vesemir, and others. However, things take a turn when Triss Marigold, a sorceress, realizes that Ciri is a source with magical potential that needs to be harnessed. Triss recommends that Geralt seek help from his ex, the powerful sorceress Yennefer, who can better assist with Ciri's gift. Of course, Ciri's enemies are still on her trail. The wizard, Rents, is hot on her heels, serving an unknown master, and he even captures Geralt's friend Dandelion in his quest for information. Yennefer comes to the rescue, but Rents manages to escape with a nasty scar from her spell. As Geralt, Triss, and Ciri make their way to the temple school in Elander for a more normal education for Ciri, they encounter a band of dwarves guarding a caravan for King Henselt. It turns out to be a trap and they are attacked. Meanwhile, a secret meeting of kings at Hag Castle decides that Ciri must be found and killed for matters of state. But fear not, the power trio of Geralt, Yennefer, and Ciri is determined to face whatever comes their way. They even manage to track down Rents and his mysterious boss with the help of Dandelion and Shani. However, things get dicey when Philippa Alhart interferes and wounds Geralt. Despite the danger, Ciri blossoms under Yennefer's guidance, and they develop a deep and meaningful bond. As they prepare to leave the temple school, Ciri reflects on their journey and admits that she didn't like Yennefer at first, but she grew to love her like a mother. And with that, they ride off into the sunset, or at least the next adventure. That concludes the third book, Blood of Elves. Now, let's talk about the fourth book, Time of Contempt. The story begins with the monarchs of the Northern Kingdoms apparently being up to no good, secretly planning a war with Nilfgaard. But little do they know that the Emperor is already one step ahead of them. Meanwhile, Geralt is on a mission to uncover the identity of a sneaky mage trying to capture Ciri, with the help of his lawyer friend Cudringer. Yennefer is taking Ciri on a wild adventure, enrolling her in a magic school on Thined Island, all while attending a fancy conference with some snooty mages. But things take a turn when Ciri gets into some trouble while exploring a menagerie and ends up using a magic amulet to escape. That catches the attention of some powerful mages who are on the hunt for Trant students. Eventually, Yennefer and Geralt reunite with Ciri, but not before some drama unfolds and choices are made about which side to take in a brewing power struggle. And to top it all off, Dijkstra, the spymaster of Adania, is trying to recruit Geralt for who knows what but Geralt is playing hard to get. It's all getting pretty intense. Bright and early in the morning, Geralt stumbles upon a wild scene, a coup attempt. Dijkstra and Philippa are the masterminds behind it all. They've ambushed several mages, including Vilgeforts, whom they plan to accuse of conspiring with Nilvagard. Emperor Amir wants to dismantle the chapter of mages, blaming their involvement in the previous war for the Empire's defeat. Tissia, the most senior mage, is livid that Philippa and her crew have ditched their neutral advisor role. But wait, it gets even crazier. Yennefer and Ciri are also present, and Ciri has a clairvoyant trance. She reveals that the war has already started, with the king of Redania being assassinated the night before, and the king of Adern attacking Nilfgaard. Tissia sets Vilgeforts and the other captured mages free so they can defend themselves, dropping the field that inhibits magic inside Artuza. But this decision proves to be a massive mistake when they attack Philippa and the Northern Mages, and a commando working with Nilfgaard invades the compound. 
Geralt jumps in to save Yennefer and Ciri, fighting off the Skotel while Ciri runs away. She eventually finds refuge at the Tower of Gulls, but Vilgefortz confronts Geralt once again. Vilgefortz tries to recruit Geralt to his side, but Geralt says no. The two engage in battle, and Vilgefortz severely injures Geralt. Ciri manages to escape through a magic portal, and the tower collapses, leaving Vilgefortz's face scarred. Tissia realizes her mistake, and with help of Triss Marigold, saves Geralt before taking her own life. After the chaos at the island, Dandelion finds Geralt in the forest of Broccolin, recovering with the help of the Dryads. He fills in Geralt on the latest news. Nilfgaard has conquered Adern, Rivia, and Lyria, while King Foltis of Temeria has made a deal with Amir to keep his kingdom. Francesca, an elven mage, is now the client queen of Dol Blathana, which she is to let Skotel remain under Emil's control. Meanwhile, a fake Ciri is presented to Amir, and he plans to marry her and legitimize his rule of Sentra while secretly searching for the real Ciri. The real Ciri wakes up in the Karath Desert and manages to survive with the help of a unicorn called That. Because, you know, names are hard to say. She uses her magical powers to heal the unicorn after it gets wounded in a fight. But the power she taps into is overwhelming, and she sees herself as a powerful witch who could destroy the entire continent. This realization horrifies her, and she decides to give up using magic. She's then captured by bounty hunters and Nilfgaard's employee. But the rats, a group of bandits, help her escape. She finally feels like she belongs among them, and even calls herself Falca, a legendary witch from history. The story suggests that Ciri, the last descendant of a Cintron royal line with elven blood, is the prophesized child who will bring about a new era by destroying the old world. And with that, we conclude the fourth book, Time of Contempt. Now, let's cover the fifth Witcher book, Baptism of Fire. So, after the big island incident, there's still a nasty war going on between Nilfgaard and the Northern Kingdoms. Francesca, the elf sorceress, is now queen of Dolblathena, thanks to Emperor Amir. But she has to hold back her support for the elven Skultel, who were initially on Nilfgaard's side, but are now in trouble. Geralt of Rivia is recovering in Broccolin Forest, and is itching to leave so he can find Ciri. The Dryad's Queen introduces him to Milva, a skilled archer who is helping guide the Skotel refugees to safety. Even though Milva isn't a big fan of Geralt, she agrees to join him on his quest along with his friend Dandelion. As they journey, they meet a group of dwarves led by Zoltan and are followed by Kahir, also known as the Black Rider, who Ciri has been having nightmares about. Despite saving Kahir from being captured, Geralt still wants nothing to do with him. However, Kahir ends up joining the group with Milva's help. They're also joined by Regis, a vampire with medical skills, who Geralt befriends. And what's more, Kahir and Geralt have been having the same dreams about Ciri, which means she's not in Nilfgaard like everyone thinks. Things get complicated when Milva reveals she's pregnant, and she eventually decides to keep the baby after talking with Geralt. Sadly, they end up in the middle of a big battle, and Milva loses the baby. Afterwards, Geralt gets knighted by the queen, and his title of Rivia becomes official. Meanwhile, Ciri is hanging out with a group of outlaws known as the Rats, and becoming way too obsessed with killing. Three months after Thaned, Francesca gets a group of sorceresses together, and proposes the Lodge of Sorceresses, which she and Philippa want to use to rule instead of just advising monarchs. But the only way the nobility will accept this is if they all unite under a single monarch who has royal blood and magical powers, which would be none other than Ciri. Yennefer, who was turned into a jade statue by Francesca, is needed to find Ciri, but Nilfgaardian sorceress Fringilla Vigo helps her escape so she can go after Vildford, who she thinks has kidnapped Ciri or who is owed retribution for his actions on Thanet Island. That's a wrap on the fifth book, Baptism of Fire. Now let's cover the sixth book, The Tower of the Swallow. By Sagoda, an elderly philosopher living in solitude in the heart of the Paraplut Swamp stumbles upon the brave and injured Ciri near his retreat. Being the kind soul he is, Visogata takes her in and nurses her back to health. 
During her recovery, Siri tells him about all the wild adventures she's had over the past few months. Siri had been happy living with the rats, but when she heard that a princess with her name was presented in Nilfgaard as the intended bride of the emperor, she knew she had to act. Siri decided to reclaim her birthright and expose the emperor's lie, but discovers that the notorious bounty hunter Leo Bonhart is after her and her rat's friends. In a tragic turn of events, she arrives too late to save her friends, and Bonhart captures her. It turns out that there are some powerful folks who want Siri alive, while others want her dead. Nilfgaard's spymaster, Vatir, wants her captured, while the Imperial coroner, Stefan Skellen, secretly hired Bonhart to kill her. However, Bonhart has other plans and pits Siri in a gladiatorial arena to prove herself. The twist? Bonhart confirms Siri's identity and training as a witcher. Meanwhile, our beloved Geralt and his rag team, the Bard Dandelion, Milva the Archer, Higher Vampire Regis, and former Nilfgaardian soldier Kahir are all on a quest to find Siri. After saving Queen Mev and Rivia, they hear that a group of baddies led by a man named Nightingale and a half-elf named Shiru have placed a bounty on their heads. But our heroes aren't afraid of a little danger and team up with Ingolim, who Geralt initially thought was Siri due to her appearance. She was a former member of the criminal group. Together they team up to take down the bandits and uncover the mastermind behind the scheme. Spoiler alert, it's the wizard Vildforts. After a nasty tussle with the half-elf Shrew, Kahir gets injured and Geralt takes him into hiding. During their downtime, the two reconcile and catch up on old times. The gang eventually reunites and heads to Toussaint to locate the druids who can help them find Ciri. But things take a dark turn when the druids capture our heroes and kill the criminals before Geralt can interrogate them. Meanwhile, Geralt has a fateful encounter with the elven sage Avalok who spills the beans about Ithlin's prophecy about the end of the world. Avalok advises Geralt not to go looking for Ciri, as her fate is already written in the stars. But Geralt being Geralt, remains determined to find her no matter what. Over in Redania, Sigismund Dijkstra, the spymaster, jets off to Kovir to seek out some serious cash for a spot of army building. But he soon discovers that the sorceress's lodge has taken over and is using magic to control the country. Triss Marigold, a member of the Lodge who is having some doubts about its plans, is searching for intel on Yennefer, who is presumed to be dead. As it turns out, Yennefer isn't dead after all. She has escaped from the Lodge and found sanctuary in Skellige. Yennefer receives a vision of Ragnar Rug, the end of the world, and is encouraged by the Modron Freya to pick a side. She heads out to find Vildfords with the help of the Jarl, Croc and Crate, and ends up getting captured by him and Shiru. They try to extract Ciri's whereabouts from her, but she remains resolute. Unfortunately, she inadvertently reveals Geralt's location, leading Vilchforts to send Shiru to take him out. In Visigoda's cozy lodge, Ciri spills the beans about her great escape. But that's not all. As her tale unfolds, we're also privy to a gripping inquest in Nilfgaard. This time, a psychic by the name of Kenna is under scrutiny for allegedly committing treason. After enduring a few months of hardship in the arena, Ciri catches the eye of Stefan Skellen, who's dead set on taking her out. Vilgefort surmises that Skellen is working for a group of ticked-off Nilfgaardian nobles, who are fuming over their daughters being snubbed in favor of the imposter Ciri. Skellen owns up to this, but also shares his belief that the Emperor must be dethroned so that Nilfgaard can become a democracy. As they chat, Ciri is freed by a turncoat and Skellen squad, and Kenna works her magic to restore Ciri's power. With her abilities back in full force, Ciri busts out of there, but not without sustaining an injury to her face from Skellen. Visigoda warns Ciri that Skellen's henchmen are lying in wait in nearby towns, so she hightails it out of there. Shortly after, Visigoda passes away from a heart attack in his humble abode, praying for Ciri's safety until the end. Ciri takes Visigoda's daughter's ice skates and lures her pursuers onto a frozen lake, then strikes. Skellen's goons go into a panic and scatter, and Rens meets his maker. Meanwhile, Bonhart hangs back, eager to catch Ciri. But to his surprise, the legendary tower of the swallow appears through the fog. 
Siri hops in and is transported to a parallel reality. The elf-like residents greet her with open arms, claiming they've been expecting her all along. That concludes the sixth book, The Tower of the Swallow. Let's now hop on over to the seventh and final book of the Witcher saga, Lady of the Lake. All right, let's set the scene. Sir Galahad, one of King Arthur's brave knights, comes across Ciri taking a dip in the water. As they chat, Ciri shares her tale, cautioning that it doesn't exactly have a happy ending. Fast forward to the present day, we find Stephen Skillen, Nilfgaard's coroner, collaborating with the sorcerer, Vilge Fortz, who has captured the sorceress Yennefer. Meanwhile, Geralt and his trusty crew, Dandelion, Regis, Milva, Angulum, and Cahir, are taking it easy in the Duchy of Toussaint. Geralt's got a lot on his plate, from slaying monsters to engaging in a little romance with Fragilla, you know, the huge for him. But things get serious when Geralt overhears a conversation between Skellen and rebellious nobles, planning to overthrow the Emperor. Skellen gives up Vilge Fort's whereabouts, which leads Geralt and his crew to leave Toussaint, except for Dandelion, who decides to stick around with his lover, Duchess Anna Henrietta. After the last book's tumultuous events, Ciri ends up in a new world, governed by the NL Elves and frequently attacked by unicorns. Time flows differently here, and Ciri is stuck behind a magical barrier. The Sage of Avalok informs her that the only way to leave is by bearing the child of their king, Aberon. Ciri is enthralled about this, but Avalok explains that her offspring will possess a special gene that will make them the most powerful magic user ever, necessary to save the world from a looming cataclysm. But Aberon can't seem to do his part, if you catch my drift. Eredin Barak Glass, the leader of the Calvary unit, informs Ciri that she'll never be able to escape. As Ciri attempts to make a daring escape on her trusty steed, Kelpie, she's met with a frustrating barrier. But don't worry, she's not alone. Unicorns come to her aid, including that one, who she rescued previously. Remember the time of contempt? They let her in on a secret. She can get past the barrier by boat. But before setting off, Ciri discovers Oberon on his deathbed, thanks to an aphrodisiac from that sneaky Aridin. She stays with him until he passes, then steals a boat, only to be confronted by Aridin himself. Cue epic battle between Ciri and the villainous Aridin, and a daring escape with the help of her unicorn friends. Meanwhile, the Battle of Brenna is raging. The Northern Kingdoms emerge victorious, sending the Nilfgaardians packing. Back to Ciri who arrives at Vilforge's castle, hoping to trade herself for Yennefer, only to be imprisoned by the villainous mage. But never fear, Geralt and his crew are on the way, and a dramatic battle ensues. Yennefer is rescued, but there are casualties, including Geralt's companions Milva and Inglumi, and Cahir at the hands of Bonhart, who then meets his own end thanks to Ciri. Eventually, Geralt and Yennefer face off against Vilgefortz, resulting in Regis' death and Vilgefortz's defeat. With Ciri in tow, the trio leaves the castle, only to run into Emperor Amir and his Nilfgaardian army. Plot twist, Amir is Ciri's father, and he's got big plans for his daughter, including making her empress and impregnating her to save the world. But before things can't get too out of hand, Ciri intervenes, moving Amir to spare Geralt and Yennefer, and changing the course of events. So, Yennefer and Ciri get summoned by the Lodge. But Geralt and Ciri decide to take a detour to Toussaint, where they rescue none other than Dandelion from execution. Talk about timing. After the adventure, Ciri heads off to meet the Lodge, while Geralt and Dandelion go to Rivia. But things don't go smoothly for Geralt of Rivia, a riot breaks out, and Geralt gets impaled by a pitchfork while trying to save his non-human friends. Thankfully, Ciri, Yennefer, and Triss arrive just in time to save the day. Yennefer and Triss conjure a storm to disperse the rioters, but Yennefer passes out while trying to heal Geralt. That's when things get really interesting. Ciri's unicorn, a creature thought to be dead, shows up and channels his powers through Ciri to heal Geralt. With the unicorn's guidance, Ciri and her friends put Geralt and Yennefer on a boat that appears out of nowhere, and they disappear into the fog. Ooh, dramatic. Later, when Ciri finishes telling her story to the Galahad, she decides that the ending isn't quite right. 
she thinks Geralt and Yennefer should get married and live happily ever after. Galahad invites Ciri to Camelot, and they ride off into the sunset holding hands. What a wild ride! That brings us to the end of the seventh book, The Lady of the Lake and The Witcher Saga. I hope you have enjoyed this journey through all the Witcher books. Now, I of course had to glance over a lot of details in the books. So if you're interested in a longer summary of each of the books, let me know in the comments. Thanks again for watching through the end, and I hope to see you next time. See ya!